Hello everybody, welcome to the third Thursday Inventors Gathering of April 18th. I'm recording this after the fact. Uh, I recently was at Colorado Mesa University giving the Public Invention Polyvent Ventilator and Associated Technology to Professors Michelle Melantine and Talis Santos. What you're about to see is a lecture that they gave while the three of us were at Colorado Mesa University. Professor Melantine will talk about uh, the viscoelastic properties of the lung and her research in uh, electrical impedance tomography and ventilator-induced lung injury. Professor Santos will then talk about some very exciting electrical uh, impedance tomography imaging that he and his students are doing at Colorado Mesa. They intend to use the polyvent ventilator, which was made by Public Invention, for both classroom education and research. That sounds better. Okay. I think it's good now. Um, so as I was saying, um, so with fiscal elastic um, properties, you can use what we call as a single compartment model of the lung. So that means for a given patient or a given subject, you want to model the tissues of that specific individual. So one thing I worked on extensively was coming up with patient specific models and the measurements that I used are um, pressure volume loop curve measurements. So here are just some examples of what those pressure volume loop measurements look like. These are both uh, measurements that would come from a mechanical ventilator. It's not always all they're displayed on a ventilator, um, but the black solid lines in both of these cases. So here you can see what um, pressures is pressure driven ventilation. Uh, we had peak pressures of 30 for one group and low peeps. So low peeps and high pressure is known to cause ventilator induced lung injury. And that's a mechanism that or basically a, a, a pathology that I was working on studying. So when you look at these curves, essentially what happens is when you have mechanical and ventilator induced lung injury, you'll see that after about two hours of ventilation, um, the curve actually moves lower, which means for given pressure, you have less volume in the lung, which is a sign that you have injury in the lung. In the red case, this is a model of a mouse that has acute respiratory distress syndrome or fluid in the lung. So in that case, the solid line is the starting point, and then the ending line is um, the end of ventilation. Um, the greater sort of dipping or kind of exaggerated, like the further it moves down in terms of less volume, that's going to mean that there's greater lung injury. And so one of the things that we worked on was creating predictive models to try to understand um, which portion of the lung was available to be recruited. So how much of the lung was essentially collapsed but could be opened up. Uh, and to try to understand, um, basically put some greater context onto these pressure volume curves. So one of the things that we're really interested in about using um, the free Spirico platform and the Polyvent is one of the things that I'm interested in is using that data in combination with electrical impedance tomography um, to try to basically get better information about what is going on in terms of mechanical ventilation. And ultimately, the idea would be to be able to provide information about recommended settings based on perhaps this model um, and or a combination of that with EIT. All right. And I think I'm going to stop the share here for a second and I'll go back on mute because I have Talis' slides as well and then I'll switch spots here with him. Hey, hi. So my name is Talis Santos and I'm a teaching assistant professor here in, at CMU in a CMU CU Boulder partnership program that we have here in. And I would like to introduce myself, speak a little bit of, about things that I have been doing uh, before I come here. And also I would like to talk a little bit about uh, electrical impedance tomography and later uh, speak a little bit about the project that we have been developing here the last year and also how we are going to interact and how we are going to join uh, Robert's um, projects. It will be interesting. 
So, uh, as I told you, my name is Thales Santos. If you want to take uh, to know more about uh, what I have been doing, there is like two websites that you can go from CU Boulder and also Colorado Mesa University that you can take a look. And the most important, I'm from Brazil and uh, it's a small town in the middle of uh, Brazil that you have a lot of beautiful natural places. So you are welcome to go there and visit me during the summer. So uh, most part of the uh, my studies was in, were in Brazil. I went to the electrical engineer program of the Federal University of, São, uh, of Minas Gerais. And then after this, I went to Sao Paulo to study in the University of Sao Paulo, where I did my master degree and also my PhD. In both uh, master degree and PhD, I was working with electrical impedance tomography. And then I figured out <laughs> when I was doing this presentation that it has been more than 10 years working this topic. So I started work with some bovine pericardium. So some, uh, when you are manufacturing some artificial hard bulbs, you can use bovine pericardium in the process. And sometimes uh, the, uh, the valve will fail because the bovine pericardium was not good enough. So we try to develop a control test using electrical impedance tomography that I will explain later. Uh, to try to sort this kind of tissue and make better valves with uh, less failing uh, in the process. And for my PhD, what I did was I worked with the, I think is the most relevant uh, application of electrical impedance tomography now that it's for monitoring uh, lungs in the intensive care units. So I tried to develop a new algorithm that was improving the, uh, the spatial resolution of the image that we have. You're going to see that for electrical impedance tomography, the resolution of the images are a little bit poor. We have some good resolution uh, in the time, but not in the spatial. So this is something that we are going to try to be improving. And, uh, and after doing my PhD, I went to join the Colorado State University, where I worked with uh, Dr. Melanchthon uh, advisor there. And what part of this, uh, this uh, part of my PhD and also my postdoctorate, I worked in a company called Timpel Medical that they, uh, it's from Brazil, and they have been developing electrical impedance tomography hardwares that now they can sell. And also it was relevant during the pandemic because this will help uh, to, to treat the patients when they are in the int intensive care units with artificial ventilators. So uh, first of all, what's electrical impedance tomography? It's an imaging technique, low cost and no invasive that you place uh, electrodes around a domain, in this case, uh, in this example, around the, uh, the chest. So then you can impose some currents with a very low amplitude that the patient will not feel. And based on the inputs that you are giving, you are going to measure some voltages. And then if you have the voltages and the currents, you can try to estimate the resistivity distribution in the domain. And if you have this resistivity distribution, eventually you can use this to, to get some parameters that will help the physicians to, for example, adjust the artificial ventilator settings. So this is, uh, I think, is the most relevant goal for the electrical impedance tomography for lungs monitoring. So uh, for the electrical impedance tomography, IT, uh, you have industrial and medical application. I will try to give you uh, some examples. And uh, this technique is considered what they call inverse problem. So, and also it's a nonlinear, you post, what means that you don't have a unique equation or unique, unique uh, uh, solution. So then you have to use regular regularization methods to try to, to get the images. And also it's a you conditionate problem, which means that if you have a low uh, change in the input, you have a huge change in the output. And then what means that if you have noise 
in the input, what we are measuring, you are going to have a lot of artifacts in the image when you are trying to re reconstruct the, the voltages. Uh, one application that I can talk about uh, is uh, detection of cracks. You can try to place the electrodes around some concrete structures. And then eventually there is a crack inside of the structure that you cannot uh, see outside. So then this technique can uh, uh, can help you to try to prevent, for example, some, uh, not prevent, but try to identify some cracks in the structures. Other thing that uh, you can apply is, uh, in Brazil, it's pretty co common you have summer uh, storms, and then eventually you're going to see some trees falling down, and sometimes you cannot uh, predict that they will fall because you look, the, the, the tree is green, no problem outside, but then eventually something growing inside or you have some problem in the trunk of the tree, and then this will cause why uh, the, the tree is falling. So eventually you can try to use the same technique. If you place the electrodes around the, the tree, you can identify and see some uh, resistivity uh, or electrical properties of the tree that will show you if there is something wrong with the trunk. And eventually you can cut this uh, tree before this tree falls down. And for example, hit the uh, transmission line or something or a car or a person. So this is one of the application. And I think the most important right now for EIT is the lung monitoring, as I was telling you. And I would like to show you, this is the Timpel Medical uh, website. And I would like to show you, so you, uh, this is the equipment that they are developing there. And I would like to show you this video. So basically this is uh, the image that you are going to see when you are monitoring the lungs of the patient, um, you are, we are trying to emphasize the lungs. So then you cannot see, for example, heart or the, uh, the bones. And, and then from this image, you have some uh, interesting um, information that you can, uh, it can help the physician to decide what you have to do with the patient. Uh, the first one is what they call ventilation map. So then basically this is uh, representing uh, uh, the mean of the, uh, the, the images during a brief cyclone, cycling. So, and here you have what they call uh, anterior posterior rate and uh, right and, lung, uh, and left rate that, for example, uh, you are looking for patients that will be 50-50. So in this case, for example, the left part is uh, 40, which means that it's not breathing well. So then you can manipulate the patient somehow that you're going to give more space for this lung to, uh, to breathe uh, rightly. And also you have what they call plethysmogram that will uh, have, give you some idea how, how much volume of, your, of air you are imposing the patient based on the images. And also they have a function that they call PEEP titration, that they can try to adjust better the PEEP, the positive and expiratory pressure of the patient based on the image that you, you have. So basically we don't want to overextend the lung, but also you don't want to see the alveoli collapsing, doing like these movements. So then if you have the right pressure, you are going to have the good compromise between over extension or collabing uh, the alveoli. And as you can see, the images, uh, they're pretty poor if you compare, for example, with a CT scan. But if you, uh, we can generate, for example, 50 images per second, so the temporal part is pretty important. So you can get some information that even with this low uh, spatial resolution, you can get information that you cannot take from a CT scan, for example. Oh, how can, oh, how can I go back to... Okay, uh, yeah, so, and then here is what I was talking about, the ventilation map. 
And also, uh, this is an example of how good you can see uh, what's happening in uh, in the lung. So then, uh, for example, this lung is collapsing this part, and you can see from this image that there is no movement here. So there is no air moving here. So then, uh, you can use this to uh, to help the physicians to to treat the patient. And the good thing about this is that you can put these uh, electrodes in the patient and monitor for several days. And if you want to take a CT scan, you have to remove this patient to another room usually and try to take the CT scan. And you can just take once. And for EIT, you can take uh, you can be monitoring this patient for several days. And what we are going to try to do here is when they decide to, to come here to join the department and teach here, I was like, okay, I would like to keep researching here. However, here uh, it's a teaching university uh, or, or teaching job, which means that they don't have so much uh, research. So then I was like, okay, how can we manage these and, and see if we can research a little bit and we can give or provide this kind of experience for our students. So basically the way that we thought it was, okay, maybe we can have some capstone projects that they can develop new technologies. And for last year, we had the first capstone project related with the EIT. And basically we started to build our first uh, hardware here. And one of the things that it was important for us here is to make sure that we'll be open source. So I think it's a, uh, since we would like to share this knowledge with other people and we would like to teach the students about this technology, I think it's good if, you can, if they can have access to the, to the codes, to the hardware design and all this stuff. So the first um, capstone project was speaking about that. And then during the, the, the last month, we were discussing about how we could incorporate artificial ventilator and Dr. Michelle uh, told me that she, uh, we have a partner that is that was developing a artificial ventilator that also was open source, and that was a perfect match. So that's why we decided to to join uh, Robert uh, project. So then it will be super interesting if you can have an open source artificial ventilator connected with EIT hardware. So, and then we can try to make something different or new. So I think uh, here is uh, the first uh, the first results that we're having. For now, we are uh, having like uh, eight electrodes. And this is uh, as, as it, it's an acrylic tank. It's a really thin, like maybe three or four centimeters high. And we can place a object here with a, a different uh, resistivity than the saline solution that we are filling out uh, the, uh, the acrylic tank. So then you can see and you can identify where, the, uh, the, where is the position of the, the, the object. So this is like a start pointing. And uh, what we are going to try to do, we are going to try to improve and uh, the noise, uh, the noise of the system, but also try to increase the number of electrodes. Usually, for uh, uh, medical equipment, they are using like thirty-two electrodes. So then we can uh, try to use more electrodes and uh, becoming uh, something close to what we can see in the industry. And the good thing about this is that all of this, all of the blocks of this hardware is implemented here with our students and we can domain and we can understand every single part of the hardware. So then uh, what we are trying to do as the artificial ventilator, we are trying to, uh, to have small blocks that we can improve later. Like we have another capstone project to improve the, uh, the management part. And also we can have another uh, project to try to, to make with more electrodes or make faster the, the number of images that we can measure. So, and goes like this. And so thank you very much, uh, Robert, to join us and to come here uh, to help us to, to develop this project. And I'm super excited to be part of this. Cool. Okay. okay. Um, so do we have any questions for uh, Dr.
Carlos, uh, Dr. Santos, maybe you could uh, just go ahead and come off mic and ask directly, uh, or if you're too shy. So what is the resolution of the, what you were showing? It looked relatively low, like maybe 100 pixels by 100 pixels. Yeah. Is, is that approximately correct? So uh, usually the images are 64 times 64. 64 by 64. Yeah, okay. but uh, this doesn't represent actually uh, because you can uh, you can uh, interpolate and make bigger or smaller. So this is not a, I would say that's not a good parameter to okay. define. But it's really poor. Like it's the same when you go to a ultrasound uh, exam that you see a lot of blur, and the person will say, "Oh, look that! Look this!" And you're like, "I have no idea what they're talking right. about." Right. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. But then, uh, if you show this kind, uh, this kind of image for a physician that is trained, they can, they can have see. a lot of information. Okay. They see okay. a lot of details that is not uh, easy to see if you are not trained. Okay. Okay, but it definitely it's poor. So this is, I think, is the big challenge of our technology. I see. Is how to improve the uh, the resolution of the image. And, and one of the ways to improve that resolution, like there's a couple of different strategies that researchers are doing to do that. So one limitation is the number of electrodes that you have, and also the the signal to noise ratio, so the quality of measurements that you're <laughs> able to measure. So if you can inject on more electrodes and measure on more um, and, and measure on all those electrodes simultaneously, you can definitely get higher quality measurements. So there's some hardware pieces, I guess, that do limit the spatial resolution, but I would say number of electrodes is probably the big one. Mm -hmm. um, and then in addition to number of electrodes, it's really the algorithm as well. Um, as Dr. Santos pointed out, it's an ill-posed inverse problem, which means that it's really difficult to find, you know, you don't want to over-assume things in terms of like you can add prior information and a lot of the good algorithms do, but if you add too much prior information and you weight that too heavily, you have the risk of missing something that is there. So okay. I think there's, with inverse problems, it's always kind of tricky um, in that regard. Yeah. And also one thing that's interesting that people are trying to apply for improving this uh, resolution, it's uh, machine learning. So there are people working with machine learning to try to improve. And it's very interesting the way that they are solving the problem, trying to, to do this. Okay. Uh, great. So unless someone has a, I know Orasio does some work with fuzzy systems and so forth, but if no one has a technical question about inverse problems, I think we should go on to talk more philosophically and maybe wrap up this session. Uh, I apologize to the audience. Our demo of the polyvent is not as good as the professor's talks here because our, our, we didn't have a chance to practice our, our setup here. The, the thing that I uh, love is um, Dr. Santos's uh, commitment to open source. And what, what I see everybody here trying to do is to democratize this kind of technology, both for research and for medical purposes. And so um, this, university might at the moment be leading the way in electrical impedance tomography in certain ways, but it's doing it in an open source way. So it's inviting other people to duplicate the work and, and expand upon the work. And of course, that's what we're doing with the ventilator as well, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this idea of the so-called net effect that in some mathematical systems, the value is equal to the square of the number of participants, right? And what we're hoping to do with the complete free respiration ecosystem, which we've conceived, which now might include some um, imaging technology, right, is to gain the benefit of the net effect applied to a larger number of people. And so um, I'm just thrilled if, if Colorado MISA is going to use the polyvent in any way for this, um, because as some of you may know, Nathaniel Beshard, um, Victor Sutran, and Antal Zyderwick, and a number of other people, you know, worked for many years, many hours making the polyvent. Um, and I was afraid the project was almost dead until this happened. And so I promise the professors that I'm going to do everything I can to make it the polyvent a success uh, for their use, both for research and for education. 
here. Yeah. So I would say that uh, our main focus right now is how we can use this to to show the students about the mechanical ventilation and also EIT and how to connect them. There's a lot of topics related with this that we can uh, we can explore. Yeah, I think it'll be fun for us to play with it here kind of as the semester wraps up. And in the fall, we're both team teaching a biomedical engineering class. And one of our projects that we're gonna have with those students is actually going to be to duplicate this system and, and put one together so that we feel like we really understand the ins and outs of this ventilator so that we feel empowered to change away as we need to. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the audience uh, before we uh, stop the recording here? Okay, well, uh, I'm, oh wait, here, uh, a question from Sylvia Casillas, uh, a PhD student um, at Sinvestov University in Guadalajara. Go ahead, Sylvia. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Well, uh, I'm working with uh, some epilepsy uh, detection in brain areas. On, um, well, I, I don't mean that it's similar, but uh, when we work with that, we know that uh, we have some artifacts when they well, I work with rats, but when they move, they have like some artifacts. I think that maybe in your, well, you have also artifacts, right? By movement or something like that? Yes. How do you train that? Well, treat that, sorry. So uh, we have a lot of artifacts because the shape of the patient. So mm -hmm. if you think about the shape of the patient, especially when they're, they are for uh, for a long time in uh, in a bed on a bed laid, so they will change the shape during the days, and this will affect uh, all the images because we need to know the shape to try to model this for our inverse problem. So then, what we are trying to do is we are trying to predict the shape based on, for example, a belt that we can have some sensors to try to identify uh, like the shape of the patient. So this is one of the things. And also you were saying that we're working with brain. There is a group from Finland that is developing EIT for brain. So eventually uh, this could be a good technique to apply in our research. Yeah, well, I'm going to use uh, deep learning, convolutional mm -hmm. neural networks to mm -hmm. try to, well, I use wavelet transport. I don't know, I don't know if you are about yes, wavelets. Yeah. Yeah, wavelets. Uh, yeah, and in those wavelets, we are uh, like searching like a like a circle that represents like an uh, um, focus, epilept epileptic focus. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe I don't know if we if you can make something. For example, I don't know. I'm just imagine. For example, if you have like this image of a I don't know. Hope to work a a good uh, long. Maybe you can mm -hmm. try to make an organism to work with the with the polyband, and I don't know if it could work. All right, it's just like an. <laughs> That's an interesting thought. So, uh, if I understood you, you are uh, you are applying like nonlinear uh, filters to try yeah. to improve your images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm. Uh, yeah, something. It's like, like much. Uh, I would say much frequency uh, filters since you are applying wavelets. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I've never tried this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that you can uh, you can make the images. Uh, for example, you can try to identify better. For example, the the edges between like the the end of the lungs and the rest of the tissues based on this kind of technique. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. There is some. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? When I was in um, graduate school, there was a famous professor there, and he said, in the classroom, silence is golden. And sometimes you have to wait a while for someone to come up with a question. So I've gotten very good at being very patient and waiting uh, for someone to come up with a question, but not infinitely patient. So if no one has a question in the next 10 seconds, then we're, I'm afraid we're going to terminate this meeting or at least stop the recording. 
Okay, well, I counted to 10. So thanks everybody. Uh, sorry for the little technical problems. We'll do a better job demoing the poly event at some other time. I really appreciate everybody being here. Um, the inventors gathering in May is going to be very interesting because uh, I will not be there. Uh, Joe Hirschberger is going to demonstrate the passive fair fluid check valve, uh, which should be an interesting session. So I really appreciate everybody coming, um, uh, especially those of you who are um, uh, perhaps at an inconvenient time zone. And I'm now going to stop the recording.